Welcome to Exhibition. And hello, Todd Fuller. Hey, Richard, how are you doing? I'm doing really well, thank you, and uh, great to see you there. Um, your exhibition is 1727 Pieta for Adrian at M Contemporary in Sydney. Um, and, and this is an intriguing exhibition involving animation, uh, paintings, um, a story of love and terrible injustice based on a historical event. So could you give us a sense of, of how you came to this uh, history and how you decided to create the exhibition from it? Uh, I would love to. So the, the first exhibition idea actually came about in 2017. And it was after the uh, plebiscite, basically, that I decided to spend a Saturday on the studio floor listening to all the uh, parliamentary speeches from the day that the yes vote went through. And for me, what I thought was going to be a very uh, uplifting uh, and affirming process actually had this moment that was extremely outraging and inspiring all at once. And that was listening to Bob Catter talk about how um, basically the tone of his speech was the gay community might have won this one, but they've only got 60 years of evolution on their side and I've got 3 million of it on mine. And for a man who wrote a book about a passionate history of Australia, I was amazed and outraged that he essentially erased queer history from the Australian narrative. So by that night, I basically had a, a diary full of research, uh, 10 to 15 stories that I thought these all need to be shared, these all need to be made animations about, and it's really important that we uh, unearth and make visible how prevalent queer people have been in the Grand Australian narrative. So we go back to 1727, uh, and what was that story? Um, and perhaps as you take us through the, 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 the narrative that, uh, that you share in various ways in this exhibition, we can see some um, extracts from your animation, which will show us part of how you've handled this love story. Absolutely. So I guess it's worth noting that being, uh, you know, pre-Captain Cook um, arriving, not discovering Australia, um, the evidence we have is very limited. We, this whole um, narrative is basically alluded to in a diary and a ship log. Uh, and essentially it's the story of uh, a Dutch ship uh, on its maiden voyage towards Batavia, which we now know as Jakarta. And the captain decided that he wanted to see uh, Western Australia, which was relatively newly discovered. So he goes off course and in doing so, he runs the ship aground on a reef. So um, 10 people drown trying to, to offload this boat and another 11 of the ship's finest jump on a long boat and go to, uh, to rescue or to find land and they never return. And the rest of the crew basically for the next nine months, they, um, they start building another boat. They move to, the, to Gun Island. And it's during this nine months that two young boys are accused of sodomy. Um, so three, three shipmates basically said they caught them in the, the gruesome act of Sodom and Gomorrah. And in doing so, what we have is the first recorded, at least from a European sense, the first recorded um, moment of gay intimacy, if it's true, as well as the first recorded um, court case, essentially, that takes place on the ship around gay rights uh, and a, a gay hate crime, basically. It's the first gay hate crime that occurs in Australia from a European perspective at least. Um, and basically the, ship, the ship's crew torture the boys through this case. They put firecrackers in their fingers and they, the boys still won't confess. But the crew are so concerned and so worried that uh, this act will bring the divine justice of God down on the crew that they decide to abandon the two, the two young boys on an island so that they basically can watch each other starve to death um, so, so it's a really actually... So they, so they decide that they will maroon these two young people. Absolutely. So the end of the story is basically watching these two boys on, on separate islands um, stare at each other into oblivion as they potentially go mad or die of thirst or God knows how they, their lives ended, some sort of tragic way. Um, 
it's worth noting, I, I speculate quite a lot in this story. There's, there's not a lot of evidence. I made it into a bit of a romance. I added in some flirting. I added in some courtship. I added in a subtle touch to the leg um, because I, I thought it was important to do that. So often when we're dealing with this type of historical material, we err on the side of safety. But in doing so, a lot of really possible and plausible things are written out. So this was a chance to say, no, this, this actually could have been gay love. This could have been gay romance, or it could have just been, you know, two very horny sailors. But either way, I wanted to take the line that this did happen and speculate around that act. Why for you on this occasion was this the form of art that you wanted to create? And, and of course, it, it is for you a form that you've used quite a number of times before over the years. Yeah, um, I've been animating now for 10 or 12-ish years. I started at the National Art School um, and upon graduating and, and towards the end of my degree, I was experimenting with all different types of animation and I, I feel like I've come to sort of my own way of handling the art form, but I find it really important and poignant as a medium for telling queer stories because one of the things that we as the, the gay community risk is being erased. Um, there are so many wonderful queer stories in history that have been washed out, like many minorities. There's a real vulnerability to these stories. So that act of drawing and redrawing is me trying to make these things permanent, but it's also a way of articulating that these things can be really lost and they're quite vulnerable and fragile if we don't take the time to preserve and look after these really important stories of the people who came before us. And of course, the lessons that we can learn from those stories. You mentioned drawing and redrawing. Can you share with us some of the practicalities of making, uh, I think in total, this is uh, something more than six minutes of, of animation, but a huge amount of practical work goes into that. Can you share a little of that process? Yeah, so this, this particular animation is uh, approximately 2,900 stills, which is a pretty low. Usually I, I'm closer to three or 4,000 stills. Um, and it basically, it's a piece of paper on a wall, a camera, and um, a lot of pacing backwards and forwards, making a mark, take a photo, make a mark, take a photo, paint it out, take a photo, paint it over, take a photo. It's a really big ritual. Um, it's a very obsessive process. It's a very obsessive practice. Um, you know, there's, um, there's almost a choreography to it. You've got to, I like to stand in the same place. My feet should be in the same place. I try and keep the lighting consistent. Um, there's this whole ritual around it that I get suck in, sucked into and that I'm quite addicted to. Um, and I find it to be the ultimate storyteller in a way. It's, it's this really beautiful and compelling way to make drawings alive. Because in my head, when I'm drawing a character, it's not static. It's a real thing. And this, this medium allows me to breathe life and breathe motion into the drawings that, um, that compel me. It does seem to suggest that that the act of drawing for you has to become, as it's repeated and repeated and repeated, uh, almost second nature. You almost have to be able to do it without thinking to make that motion happen. Um, or is that my assumption? Is it is it actually a, a, a very carefully calculated process? There's definitely um, um, a, a colleague of mine, Kelly O'Dempsey, describes it as the flow state where you get into this rhythm where you are not really conscious, you are just doing, um, and you're not making decisions per se, you're just in the flow and the groove of it. Um, nothing feels particularly conscious. Um, that happens a lot. And I find animation actually, A, I draw better when I'm in the flow state, when I'm animating in this way. I don't know if I'm tapping into something, some sort of neural pathway or, or whatever. Um, but when I get into that flow state, it, it kind of just happens. And I, I feel I draw better there and I make better decisions there because I'm not making decisions. The, the work kind of um, comes through me in an intuitive sense. I hate saying that. Um, I sometimes find it a cop out when other artists say it, but it really does come from, um, from somewhere I can't necessarily describe when I get into that right groove. And I find that I get into that groove much quicker when I'm animating. And I think that's to do with that choreography I just spoke about. We'll come back to the animation again uh, before this discussion concludes, but let's go and have a look at some of the other parts of the exhibition now, some of the other works, um, because the other painted works in the exhibition relate very much to both the story and the animation. How would you describe the, the other works? 
So the, the works on paper, um, it's, it's kind of this weird thing that happens with these types of exhibition because the works on paper, they're kind of secondary when I'm making them. They're just a means to create motion and to create the animation. But then when the exhibition comes around, those things that were secondary suddenly become framed and put on their own pedestal and given their, their, their time and their justice. But in doing so, what they capture is all the mistakes, all the remnants, all the grubby marks, all the residue of this process. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's the chance to give them their own moments. These exhibition uh, pieces range from uh, narrative parts of the story through uh, portraits, uh, through to a landscape or perhaps seascape more accurately. Um, how are they differentiated for you? And, and do you approach each of those, those different uh, forms of image in a different way? Mm. So, yeah, that's a really great question, Richard. Um, some of them started with just morsels of evidence. So, for example, um, there's a piece, Moonlight from the Crow's Nest, and it's basically just an allusion to the fact that in the ship's log a half an hour before it was run aground, um, the, from the crow's nest, someone thinks they spotted a reef, but quickly dismiss it as moonlight on the water. So that introduction, that introductory scene is basically an allusion to the fact that this whole thing could have been prevented um, if that uh, dismissal didn't take place. Other images are more about trying to convey um, emotions or the framework of the relationship or, um, or are derived from other aspects or other elements or are actually pieces that are completely imaginative and speculative, such as the, the kiss scene and both kiss scenes, basically. We, we have no evidence that the two boys frolicked on the beach. Um, that was just an idea that I injected into the story. One of the speculations, I guess, that must have occupied your mind is, is what these two individuals looked like as, as people. Um, but you do offer us a portrait of both of them, a speculative portrait in the work Pieta for Adrian, uh, 1727. Can you give us a sense of how you came to the portrait of the two of them? Uh, there's, a, there's a really embarrassingly practical side of that, Richard, which is um, I, I did a, a scout for models and um, I had a few options available, but the two that came forward, I really liked the look of them. I really liked their personality. Um, and so they became the models that I worked with at the start of this process to generate a lot of the stimulus material that I drew from. Um, there's, another, there's another artist, Drew Pettifer, who's um, done a, a, a very different body of work, but a body of work around the same story. And he actually tracked down and found the descendants of these two figures. And they're, they're both, um, they're as you would expect of a, a Dutch person. They're very blonde, they're very fair, they're blue eyed. Um, and I kind of deviated from that quite a lot. Um, I, I wanted something that was more of a rugged sailor-esque stereotype so that I had gave myself a little bit of permission to step away from the source material and have a little bit more fun with it. You mentioned earlier the the, the terrible torture that was inflicted on these two youngsters to try to make them confess. Um, can you tell us just a, a little more as a work uh, about the work titled Resolved to Place Burning Fuses Between Their Fingers? So basically that scene is showing um, the man in the back who turns away, that's him, that's the act of, of, um, of denial, of, of saying, no, we didn't do this. And the man in front rocking is him in the act of torture. And they, of course, are surrounded by the other members of the crew. Um, and that, that scene, that little vignette is depicted on the silhouette of uh, another scene, a former scene, which was the start of the boys frolicking in the surf. Um, there's a real layering of time that I like to do in these types of pieces, because even though I'm telling a story that is quite linear, it's A, a to B in a lot of ways, I also like to lay a time over itself. I also like to create space in these stories so that our audiences can start injecting or, or putting their own aspects or their own spin into it. I'm not looking to create a, a cinema piece. I'm looking to create an artwork, if that makes sense. Um, so that particular piece is multiple different moments all collaged over one another. When you talk about that layering, um, let's, let's talk about what people will actually see physically when they look at these artworks on the walls. 
and, and it's clear that the, there are many layers over uh, what appear to be old maps. And then you've painted and drawn and erased and worked on these. Tell us about those layers and, and what's right there at the bottom, the old map. Yeah, so um, I, I thought early on the actual, um, the actual maps from the period are fascinating pieces in themselves because they show, they show a time that society was grappling with the ideas of cartography and discovering worlds and discovering boundaries and also colonising, which is a whole other framework that is, um, you know, messy and ugly and has, has long-term um, terrible consequences. But the maps themselves are also very beautiful things. And so um, on one hand, physically, they create a great surface to respond to and to react to. But on another surface, um, metaphorically, they show um, kind of an incomplete understanding of the world around us. Uh, because, you know, Australia is kind of half there in the map and it's kind of linked with Indonesia and there's a lot of speculative mapping, if, so to speak, within those maps. Um, so the, the first port of call on this project was getting permission to um, access those prints and to print them off so that they could be the, the ground of the artwork, so to speak. And the final of the, of the works that we might look at on the wall, uh, so to speak, the title is Two Queer Masters, 1727. So what are we seeing here? Because this finally is, I think, as you've suggested before, very much a work of your imagination, speculation, maybe even romantic assumption. It's, it's my favourite piece from the show, actually, Richard. Um, and it's a piece where the two boys um, finally uh, let go to their urges. Their, the assumption is they're swimming in, in off the coast of one of these islands. Um, they've been flirting and they just go with it. And they have that wonderful um, teenage rom-com-esque first kiss as they swirl around one another in the surf. Um, completely and utterly romantic, completely and utterly sappy. But, um, but another, another aspect to this is so often in mainstream media, we don't necessarily see depictions, or at least until recently, we haven't seen depictions of same-sex love in the same way that we've seen uh, heterosexual love. So for me, it's always important to try and be really clear and to actually make those things visible. So this was that moment that I really just make their connection, make their passion, make their possible love as the way I've chosen to tell the story visible. Um, and it's, it's totally kitsch and it's totally corny, but, um, but I wanted to do, I think it's important to show leadership and to show these things when we're talking about queer history and queer stories. Can we conclude by, by me asking you therefore, what are you hoping to share with the viewers of this exhibition? And perhaps what are you hoping to prompt in their in their thinking emotionally or rationally yeah I think one of the risks I, I talked before about history being lost and these stories being lost one of the risks we have as a society is if we don't look back at these moments we won't learn from them we've just uh in recent history we've gone through a plebiscite and even today there are so many um moments of gay hate crimes uh and discrimination against the gay community and actually against many minorities and anyone who counts as the other. And I think it's really important that we take stock of these stories and learn from the mistakes. The, um, the experience of these boys is heart-wrenching. These are two young men at the start of their life on a big adventure who were marooned because someone accused them of being gay. There's actually no evidence of that, but nevertheless, they, uh, they suffered. They didn't deserve that. No one deserves the suffering that comes from discrimination or prejudice. And we've got to start being smarter about how we include, how we support, how we appreciate, how we love those who are different in society. Um, another thing for me that's really important um, is creating role models, creating visibility, creating, um, making sure that, that uh, the, the young boys who are now in a much better position than I was, I grew up not really seeing gay role models, making sure that they have things to look through and making sure, look to, and making sure that they have uh, that visibility or that imagery that says it's okay to be who you are. Um, and that's a really important part of, of making this type of work. Well, this is a, a, a very powerful and very emotional, but also very beautiful exhibition of works. So Todd Fuller, thanks very much for sharing your exhibition with us. Thank you, Richard.